Good afternoon, kids. How is everybody today? Ah. So, everybody get accomplished what you wanted to this week? I did, but it was a huge pain in the ass. Period. It just was. And it had nothing to do with anything in this room here. It's bringing our new server online. Completely exasperating, but it is finally online. We're able to use it. It only took, I don't know, 10 times longer than it should have. But do you care about that? Well, you should because that's what's making all these uh, going forward, all these pro editing projects possible. Speaking of projects, I finally got around to bringing in our old uh, Razor. I can't remember who called in late uh, a couple of weeks ago and said theirs was down on power. And I said I was having the same problem with this one. It turned out injector number two was going out and eventually went out. So we're going to get that thing back in fighting shape. And as much as I hate it, and I hardly ever sell anything that we seem to, uh, to buy as a project, I think I may let that one go. Anybody on the uh, East Coast, specifically in Georgia, want a 2015 Razor 900S? Hmm. It'll be up for sale shortly. Well, probably in the next couple of weeks anyway. That one's been a good one. I've enjoyed testing it um, every so often at uh, Durham Town. <laughs> all right. What all did we miss from last week? All right. Kyle had asked me about his Sportsman 500, and I think we covered that, about doing the oil change, and you pinch off that uh, return line, and then you wait till it builds up pressure, and then you release it. So, yeah, I think we covered that one last week, but at any rate, that's how you do it. Brett had asked me, hi, all, not very savvy when it comes to mechanical work. So this may be, may be a dumb question. No such thing. I have a hose at the bottom of my carburetor that doesn't seem to go anywhere. Is this some of drain, a drainage hose? Well, it is of sorts. It has two purposes. One, if you were wanting to drain your carburetor bowl, there should be a, a small brass slotted screw more than likely down at the bottom of the bowl and you'd open that up after you shut off your fuel pet cot and you could you know drain your carburetor second thing it does if your float gets stuck and instead of filling up your engine with fuel it'll have an overflow tube which bypasses that valve actually and then uh, we'll let it drain out yeah, who's sending me text messages no i don't know <laughs> just no um, but yes, it is sort of some type of drainage hose, as I just described. Let's see, well, if you didn't know, it's not a dumb question at all. Ian had asked me, what is the max compression you can raise a YFC 450R without having to change cylinder and cylinder head? The max compression? I mean, you can take it up to like 14 to 1. If you're talking about displacement, uh, I don't think you would want to go past uh, like a uh, I don't, well, actually, you can't bore a 450 because it is a nickel, nickel, um, nickel sill plated. I think it's nickel sill plated cylinder walls. So you, you really can't bore those. Well, you can, but then you have to get them replated. Um, if you're wanting to go with a big bore kit, I would, it's typically going to be another piston and the jug itself. But yeah, I wouldn't want to go past, you know, 14, 14 to one because you're going to have to run um, race gas with that. And while that's fun and all that, it can be a bit of a bit of a pain if you do if you do anything other than just race your machine at the track. Because race gas isn't going to be abundant in most places. Well, anywhere for that matter. Ryan had asked me, I also have a question. I have a 2006 GXXR 1000. Every time I leave it for hours and go to start, most of the time it will run for five seconds. And then I have to start it again, and it's fine. Not sure why it takes two starts to keep it running after it's been sitting. Any ideas? I would think this is going to be fuel-related, and it sounds like it's um, not priming long enough. And that would be an indication that your fuel pump is getting ready to go out. But uh, that's what I would lean toward. So I think it's pulling up that prime. Well, pulling on that prime, but then it just kind of, after it 
shuts off, it loses whatever was going to the uh, to the uh, or through the pump, and it was falling off, and it's just not quite priming it up that first time around enough. So my bet would be either you know the fuel pump's going bad, the motor in it's going bad itself, or you may have a partially clogged pickup tube. Uh, this will be bad. That's really gross. I'm not going to show you. It's bad. It involves a cat. <laughs> now, Gail, you know I'm, I'm doing a live thing at three. <laughs> but she forgot what time it was. But that would be my bet. I would look at the uh, the fuel pump itself. James Woods. Oh, we have a celebrity. I have an 06 Yamaha XT225. Have no power to ignition and dash and headlights and tail lights. Don't know on what would be the cost of the bikes. It's a 2006 model. Well, that sounds to be pretty systemic to the lighting system itself. So I would definitely go look at the uh, the lighting fuse on the uh, the 225. I don't think it has, but maybe three or four fuses anyway. But that was where I would start because <clears throat> everything you just rattled off uh, has something to do with lights. So go check your fuses. I bet you've got a little five amp that's blown. Luke W. I have a problem with a Honda. 420 ATV. That is unusual. And intermitting uh, with intermittent startings. It turns over, but no starting. I have replaced the battery spark plug ignition switch. Any other ideas? I've had many technicians look at it with no luck, including a Honda dealer. Well, something is intermittently telling it not to crank. And evidently the, the starting circuit is working as it's supposed to, you know, spinning over the engine. But there's another condition, secondary condition that is intermittently telling it not to start. Um, some of those things on the 420 could be the, uh, the the gear position switch as well. And I think that one has a tip over switch as well, but I would start with the gear position switch. So pay close attention to your dash and see if it's actually showing a neutral when you go to start. Is there any other on the 420, that's the only two safety ones I can think of. Um, another one that could throw it off would be the throttle position uh, sensor, which is on the side of the, uh, the throttle body itself. I think it seems like there was a recall on that. And if there was, I'm surprised your Honda dealer did not catch it. But I think there was a recall on that one. You didn't tell me what year, though. The, the year I remember was like an 09, if I remember correctly. It's been a little while. Or it could have been a 12. Well, one of the two. All right. Well, that catches me up from last week. Let's see what we've got this week. Oh, everybody's ready to rock and roll. Um, before I start answering these questions, I believe that um, TG or that AGV helmet giveaway is still going on. I think it goes until midnight tonight. So there's still time to enter to win. If I'm wrong, Hank, you correct me in the chat, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. And did y'all tell me what we were giving away next? Can I talk about that yet? <laughs> uh, no, we didn't. Y'all didn't discuss anything. Well, if we are, just uh, drop it in the chat, Hank, and uh, I'll talk about it. How's that? All right, Paul Gravinsky. How's it going, Paul? Good Friday, John. So my next project will be a 2015 Rubicon. Not sure what size yet. Was handed down from her father. Any videos on that one in case I get stuck? No, we haven't done the yet, the Rubicon. We've never really focused in on it because they're just uh, we just didn't sell that many of them at the dealership level. So we haven't put in put forth the effort effort to acquire one and um, and do any videos on it, but. Shoot, I'll be glad to help you out. Just let me know. Uh, you also said my last few were carburetors and not fuel injected. Yeah, I think the 15, they finally went to fuel injection. Thank God. I remember at a dealership level, the, the carbureted ones were cantankerous to work on, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Law, Lloyd Wall, is there anything you can do to a 2000 TL1000 to lower it? What is a TL-1000, Lloyd? Tell me what manufacturer that is. I would assume it's a street. Okay. Um, looks like a uh, Suzuki that came out in, what, 1998? 
well, your standard stuff. I mean, you should be able to to drop the forks on the uh, on the clamps and then uh, swap out your dog bone in the back to get it to drop down. Just when you do that, um, depending on how much you drop it, yeah, don't forget to alter your kickstand. Otherwise, chances are it's going to fall over eventually. Uh, do I know of a kid off the top of my head? No, but I, I'll look around if you want me to. Um, it shouldn't be any tougher than any other sport bike to lower it on down. Lyle Thompson, a good afternoon, John. Well, good afternoon, Lyle. Thanks for joining us. Kerm, how's it going, Kerm? I haven't seen you on here in a while. Evening, John. How am I doing? I am doing quite well. What is a good bit, big bore kit for a 2013 YZ125? Is there much power gains? Well, you know what I'm going to say. Um, there's two go-tos for that. Of course, Weisco is going to have a, a bigger bore kit for the for the 125. And I believe Hot Cams also makes one as well. Uh, how far can you go? I, I think it, you, you could take it out to a, a 150, but I think that does rep um, require replacing the jug itself. And with, will there be a, a power gain? Mostly a torque power gain is what you're going to get with that kind of displacement. Not so much um, a lot more power because right? those things are kind of high strung anyway, just straight from, straight out of the box. But it, that is going to give you uh, more uh, more torque at a lower RPM, well, right when it hits the the, uh, the power band at any rate. Johnny Jixer, what's the best way to remove the one-time use safety bolts that hold on the ignition on the older GSXR slingshot? <sighs> I had to do that on our 1000. I had to um, rekey it. Um, I think I ended up having to replace the uh, the gas cap on it. I can't remember why we had to do it, but um, most of the time uh, I will just drill those out. I, sometimes I, I've been lucky enough to just use a like a Dremel tool and just cut a groove in it if you've got enough room to get in there without damaging or uh, scarring up the uh, them out too much and just using a, a flat blade to pull it out. So, I mean, there's not a lot of torque. I mean, they've got a fair amount, but you should have enough to, uh, especially if you can get a groove cut and then get a screwdriver in there, you should be able to back them out. If not, you just have to drill out the things. But I usually try the, uh, the, the groove first before I drill the whole thing out. RBM. Hey, Mr. John, I'm fixing to do a top-end rebuild on our 2011 Polaris Ranger 800 XP. Any tips before I dive into it? That one's really not that tough. I mean, it's been a while since I've done one of the uh, the 800s, but uh, the, it's nothing to be afraid of. Nothing to be afraid of at all. Uh, just get it cleaned up really well because you don't want anything that's, you know, any dirt that's you know, hanging around on the on the harness or you know, part of the body panels. Uh, to fall in it while you've got it, its heart opened up, so to speak. Just clean it up really well and then lay out everything that you're doing on a table as you uh, as you go through it. Take lots, lots of pictures, especially so you can get all the harness and everything back where, back where it started, back in uh, the same place where it should be. And you're not going to have that many nuts and bolts, but it's always easier to organize those very effectively as you take them apart. I usually do them by section and I put those and I put those uh, in individual um, Ziploc bags and just write on there what it is, you know, valve cover bolts and then head bolts and the wh whatever. It just makes it simpler. Otherwise you're sitting there a week or two later putting it together going, where did that go? That would take lots of pictures if I didn't say that already. Um, do we have one? Have we done one of those? I don't think we had. Otherwise, I'd uh, refer you to one of our um, one of our videos. But it, it's it's really not that tough. It's a push rod engine, if I remember correctly. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oh, quit jumping. All right, Dennis. Hi, John. I got my CRF 450R 2003 running. It's also was looking at the website and wondering if shipping to the Netherlands is possible. 
Dennis, I believe so. Hank, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't aren't we able to ship now out to uh, the Netherlands? That I don't think that's uh, on our no fly zone, is it? Find out for sure. Um, just call up one eight hundred number on the, the website and get to one of our customer service reps. They're going to know right off the top of their head. Joseph Carino, Carino. I have a 2005 Honda XR 650R, big bore thing. I had a 600 um, and 87. Rides fine. I <clears throat> I get a small drop or two of oil that builds up over time, coming from the bottom edge of the radiator on on the bike when the side is leaning. When the bike sits for an extended period of time. All right. So mine was air cooled, so I never had a a, a water cooled one. I'm trying to, uh, the radiator on those is um, the, the fills over to the right. So the overflow is going to be on your right. And you're saying that's coming on the, on the, on the side of the radiator. Well, evidently you've got a very small leak. I'm surprised it doesn't leak when um, you're actually underway. You're actually, when it's building up pressure. So is it going to get you eventually? Yeah. Um, my advice is to get a pressure testing kit. Don't get carried away. If I can't remember how many PSI that you can deal with, uh, or that, or a system like that can deal with it, but I think you can safely take it up to about eight to eight to 10 PSI and just sit there and look, see where that leak is coming from. Tell you if you, if you've got a whole, a very small hole in your radiator or not. And if it's a really small hole and you're not ready to replace it yet, um, there's a couple, I can't remember the manufacturers, but I picked them up at um, O'Reilly's before. They make these little ceiling tablets and you crush them up and you'd only need one for something that small and put it in there and it would seal up a small leak like that without gumming up the, uh, the, the inner workings of the, of the radiator itself. It's funny, I, I built an engine for a, uh, a BMW 325i and that damn thing, I finished it. It was just leaking like crazy on, on the side of the head. And I was like, there's no way that I, I blew out a head gasket on that. But the trick is that, you know, your main bolts for the head were here, but the head went all the way out to here. And it was just leaking on that edge. And I talked to a, a really ace mechanic. Uh, and he says, yep, John, you know, put away your sword. You know, there's no reason to kill yourself. Go pick up a tube of these things and dump them in there. That's when, if you read in the BMW manual for that particular motor, that's what BMW told you to do. <laughs> Blew my mind. I was like, he was right. A couple hours later, it finally uh, stopped leaking once I dumped those little magic pellets in there. <laughs> oh, Joseph was um, still continuing no other issues with the bike it's a mint condition just have been sitting and aging in the in the heated basement but notice the small drip every couple of months yeah if it's just dripping that small amount once again i wouldn't sweat it no pun intended but i, I would go ahead and pressure test it and see if you've got a, a bigger problem that's trying to develop inside of that radiator Uh, Void wall came back Suzuki. Yeah, I did a quick search on it to see what it was. And he said it, it has the dampener. Hmm. Uh, you, oh, you've got the steering dampener up front. I think you can still drop it though. Lloyd, let me, uh, Hank, make a note of that one. Let me do a little bit of research and see if we can help Lloyd out on that one. Deal. Lyle Thompson, I have a 2008 Grizzly 700, good machine. Fan quit working, so I started diagnosing unknowingly changed FI relay for the fan relay. Oops, uh, have not been able to get run since. Several diagnostic codes show up. Oh, so you, you flipped your relays one to the other. I'm not sure what that would do to it. Um, ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, that, that could have uh, done some damage there. Without the, uh, wow, without the schematic in front of me, I can't tell you for sure <laughs> what went on, but you, you may have done some uh, damage to your ECU. It's possible. 
that one sounds like an interesting one too, Hank. I, I want to look at the uh, schematic on it. And uh, Lyle, I'll lead off with yours and uh, Lloyd's question next week. Shit. Oh, who we got? There we go. Shaden Miranda Larson. How's it going? Hey, John. Customer wants to big bore a new KRX 1000 after he cracked the airbox on and dusted the engine. Ouch. Will that require bigger injectors? How far is he going to go? Um, I would uh, I would probably say no, but you haven't given me all the information. I don't know what the flow, uh, how close to the edge of the flow max that the 1000 is. But if you're going to do that, um, well, assuming he's going to go with a big bore, uh, you're going to have to reflash the ECU because that's going to change a bunch of the dynamics beyond what I think the stock ECU can uh, can deal with. I mean, that's what we had to do with our YXC1000R because we did, of course, we went to a turbo and then we went with bigger injectors and then we're ramping up the boost. So it, well, we had to go with bigger injectors because it just wasn't going to flow enough and that would lean it out. And you don't want that to happen. As long as you're already going to have to you know, reflash the ECU anyway, I'd say do it. And just make sure whoever's tune is going in it knows every single component that you're making a change to. Yeah, you know, I would say go ahead and do it before, before instead of after, because when these little guys, when they run out of juice, it's not it's not good in that engine. When, and plus, they're overworking themselves because it is just a pulse that's getting sent, and they're just about wide open at that point. So they're duty cycle you know you'll wear them out quicker because of that because you're running them to death no pun intended bradley owens how's it going bradley busy as always in the shop getting these engines built and shipped back to the customers enjoy the semi-decent temperatures well you aren't kidding dude i'm i'm ready for fall i've had enough of this i've had enough of summer Bring it on. Bring it on. Uh, Lyle came back. Everything works if connected direct, but will not start. No power to the fuel pump. Sure, they didn't, we didn't just snap a few somewhere, Lyle. That'd be, that'd be a simple fix. Make sure you've got uh, power coming in to the, the, that uh, relay. Maybe as simple as that. Hmm. Uh, Paul's going to chime in. Cool. Paul, Lyle, I had gone through a 2003 Grizzly 660, uh, although mine was carbs. What codes are you coming up with? Can't you switch the relays back around? Um, do you always disconnect your batter battery prior to removing and relays? Oops, any. Yeah. Let's, uh, Lyle, or um, Lyle, if you would re respond back to uh, Paul, maybe we can uh, walk you through this right now. Stephen, New Zealand. Hi, John. Missed my question earlier. I did? Hold on. Okay, got it. Hi, John. Yamaha Viking started up from cold, leave it idling, then a couple of minutes it stops. We'll start again right away. Any suggestions? Huh. What year is it, Steve? I'm, I'm just curious. And how cold are we talking about? Um, I don't remember if that one has any type of idle air control valve on it. I don't think that it does. But uh, give me the uh, the year on it. Hmm. Yeah, it shouldn't just dial off like that. So that makes me wonder if it it doesn't really know where its uh, throttle position is, and or if it has any type of uh, compensation valve, idle air control valve. I'm, I, can't be i can't remember if that one does or not but give me the uh the year on that one all right got you caught up bradley owens lyle download a manual and run through the self-diagnosis uh, system to test the fan motor and or fan relay and other relays etc access the uh, diag system for by holding select and reset buttons if you have a full screen and i love having y'all on here with me stuff i can't answer y'all just fire right in there I like that. <clears throat> Lyle came back. I put in all new relays. One was bad. I did download a diagnostic manual. 
Paul says, did your fan run, run once you uh, apply power directly to it? Yes, and the pump works with direct power. Thanks. Um, Paul, you're going where I was about to. You may have to trace a few wires and follow it till it end. I hope it doesn't connect into branches and change colors. All the fuses are good, so we're good there. It's not super cold here. Well, that shouldn't be a problem then, Steve. That makes me wonder if it's uh, getting false information sent to the ECU from the position switch on the throttle plate. That may be it. It may think it's holding it at 2 or 3% and idle uh, or at 5% when in actuality it's probably two or three. So I'd check to see what, uh, make sure that it's calibrated or set set at, at the uh, at the side of the throttle body. Tim, Tim. Hi, peace and love. I have a 2006 Kawasaki KX250F. It has no clearance between the cab lobes and the buckets at top dead center. Is that the reason it won't start? I would probably, I would say probably yes. I mean, it's definitely time to adjust the valves on that one because, um, yeah, you should, you should have something going through there. Just make sure you're at uh, top dead uh, center on your compression, uh, compression stroke and not the overlap. Robert Yao, my Honda African twin lithium batter will not turn my engine over. I need to uh, change it, but my AT will lose its DCT memory as the indicator was blank and the fuel meter is showing no fuel. Huh. It shouldn't freak it out that bad, uh, Robert. Just um, changing out the, uh, the battery on it. Hmm. I've, I have not heard of that happening. But you're saying that it was, uh, as the gear indicator was blank and the fuel meter is showing no fuel. <sighs> Is it showing any other errors and is there supposed to be a, um, a, reinit a reinitialization of the, uh, the ECU once it's lost power? Seems like I read about that in some Honda note. That may be what's going on here. Um, I've run into that before on a Range Rover, all things. You changed out the battery, you have to tell the ECU you put in a new battery and that may be what's happening to yours. So I would say give the dealer a call. It doesn't cost you anything or it shouldn't cost you anything to give them a call and see if there's any type of reset um, on that particular one. Bradley Owens, Tim, those intakes are hanging open. Most common no start condition on the MX style engines with a shim under bucket. Do a valve adjustment, hit the track. That's what I say. <laughs> Bradley says, y'all have a good weekend. Back to work. Later, Bradley, from Paul. Uh, whew, boy, uh, Lyle came back. D61 produces codes 12, 13, 15, 22, 33, 41, 43, 41, 43 and 46. Whew. Wow, that your ECU is really upset. Um, Hank, make a note of all those, and I'm going to look up the codes and see what all those uh, describe and maybe I can give you a, uh, a plan of attack to get that straightened back out. And Robert said it was an African twin 1100 2023. Do that one as well. And I'll give our Honda rep a call and, uh, and see if he knows anything about the battery ECU reconnection. Bradley Owens, he, he's, agree, he's agreeing with me. Good Lord, Kyle, just take it and trade it in with all these codes. No, never surrender. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lyle said, he's laughing about that. Paul said, Lyle, on your screen, does it come up with numbers or do you have to count how many times the blinking? Not Lyle said, the numbers do show. Yep, Paul's going to do the same thing I am. Paul, do you come up with the... Uh, what you think it is, and uh, I'll, I'll give it my best shot during the week, and we'll discuss it this coming up Friday. Everybody, sound everybody that sound like a deal? This is gonna be fun. Let's see, let's see who can hit it first, me or Paul. I'd probably bet on Paul if I were y'all. <laughs> He's pretty good. Um, Tim Tim was asking, do you know where I can buy cam shims individually? 
Tim, um, the most reasonable ones is uh, from uh, Hot Cams. They they have a complete set because the chances of you hitting it first time out is going to be very slim, especially since you have no clearance whatsoever. So you really don't know how much to adjust it one way or another. You're just going to have to guess or well, start off with the, the known smaller shim, remeasure it, and then readjust it from there. Um, uh, hot, hot, and it's an ex, not an expensive kit. And it's got a pretty wide range of uh, the ones that you're going to need. Uh, just pick it out one for your particular shim um, diameter. Uh, I think Hot Cams offers th either three or four different diameters. They, they, they cover just about all the, uh, the uh, Japanese manufacturers. So that shouldn't be, a, shouldn't be a deal. Well, we got one more. And then, shoot, we already ran through 30 minutes, guys and girls. Philly D. Uh, John, I have a O2 Jixer 600. I noticed the other day while I stopped at the light, the bike just shut off. It turned back on in a couple of times, just wondering if, what would cause this. Just to shut off like that? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, uh, you could have a, a side stand that's uh, the switch that's starting to go, um, go out on it. Could be your, uh, your tip over sensor. Seems like there's one more on that one. Now, those would be the first two I would look at or that would make it just shut off, you know, instantaneous. I'm surprised the bike's not breaking up a little bit or acting a little bit jittery when it's underway. But I'd look at those two first and see what you come up with. Lyle came back. Thanks, guys. I refuse to give up, especially knowing that I screwed up. Hey, happens to us all, Lyle. We'll see if we can get you through this. All right, guys. Uh, yeah, looks like my counterpart down in uh, Florida is kicking me out. He knows I'm about to wrap it up. <laughs> and he's saying, all right, <clears throat> this is the last day to enter to win the AGV Tour Modular Helmet. So y'all head over to Partzilla.com and in enter to win. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap, wrap it up for the day and for the week and go home. I'm tired. So glad I didn't become an you know, IT guy. Good grief. I wouldn't want their jobs. All right, kids. Well, everybody have a great weekend, a great week. And God willing, we will see you again this coming up Friday at 3. Y'all take care.